In this video, I'm going to talk about the conference Augmented Humans 2021. And you're going to uh, see all the technologies, uh, the opening keynote about virtual reality, the closing keynote about cognitive augmentation. We're going to interview one of the organizers, Peter Lopez, and I'm going to demonstrate Garter Town, which is where you can see the demonstration and also look at the papers. So what is human augmentation? Human augmentation is the use of certain technologies to augment the human. So to maybe uh, help our cells with our senses, maybe um, extra senses, or also maybe increase our motor function, or maybe also our cognitive abilities. So uh, it's a pretty broad field. Uh, and next up, I will also show you some examples of the certain technologies and also research domains that were being discussed in this conference. Uh, that's first. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the opening keynote by Mel Slater. After that, the closing keynote by Professor Patty Maas. Uh, Mel is, by the way, also a professor. Sorry, Mel. And uh, then I'm going to uh, um, show you uh, Gather Town, which is like the virtual... Uh, demo uh, exhibition area just like a normal conference which I thought was pretty cool uh, and then I'm having an interview with Pedro Lopez uh, assistant professor at the University of Chicago and he's one of the organizers of this conference. So what were the topics at the Augmented Humans Conference 2021? Um, well there were uh, the conference were, was about two days and there were seven tracks or topics as you might call them uh, it's about remixed bodies, augmented cameras, future speech, wearables, uh, movement, vision, and also yeah, category called augmented from head to toe. So this is pretty broad. Um, and to give you a better idea of um, yeah, where you can think about talking about uh, yeah, augmentations, human augmentation. Like augmentation is um, what are the use of, of sensors, of technology, to help the human body to augment, to enhance, to yeah, aid the human body, as you might say. And here are some couple of examples from the trader of the uh, conference. And also uh, when you uh, look at the live streams, uh, I will put a link down below. You can also see the presentations. And with the presentation, some of the scholars also uh, showed some videos. And as you can see, there are a lot of things uh, involved with uh, with sensing, so uh, sensing, uh, aiding our senses, or maybe uh, extending our senses, maybe coming up with new senses. For example, uh, the pseudo hand eye interaction of hand mounted display, and uh, so it's, it uses a sort of camera to yeah uh, explore the hand eye interaction. And uh, what I found really interesting is not only uh, is it like only focused on pure the technology, but I also uh, look at the, uh, this research on the transcendence of bodily uh, differences. And that's also where they looked at uh, making a sort of new kind of sports with the uh, use of a sort of wheelchair uh, kind of technology, which I found really interesting that not only, uh, so they also, it's more of a, I, in my perspective, more of psychology, anthropology kind of research. Uh, what I also found really uh, fascinating is uh, <laughs> was this paper, and I <laughs> I want to know where can I buy this device. Um, what I think it's really handy because now we only have two arms, and, and maybe in the future I will have more arms. Uh, I think that uh, that comes that <laughs> could be a use case at least for certain professions, of course, and in, in the workplace. And a lot of these domains, and I will also talk about the opening keynote by Mel Slater about virtual reality. Uh, some of the papers and scholars were also talking about virtual re reality and talking about the embodiment and how, um, yeah, what kind of effect will it have on the human body? And maybe what can we learn from it? What are, of course, the, yeah, the, what, are, what are some topics for future research? What are also some uh, discussion points? So it was a really thorough academic conference. I really like this, uh, this also uh, about a hands-free video game controller for a, a, a quadrilipic individual. So it's really nice to see how these technologies can help uh, able people, but also patients 
um, uh, yeah, we're functioning like like these the example of playing a video game. Um, so um, this this gives you an idea of uh, all the technologies and met, uh, yeah, uh, inter uh, interesting research domains. And I'm going to talk about the opening uh, keynote, which was by Mel Slater. He's from the University of Barcelona, and he talked. Uh, he's a really authority in the domain of virtual reality. Now, watch his talk. It was really interesting. Uh, he started with the rubber hand uh, illusion. So maybe if you're familiar with that, uh, where you maybe um, can give a, a person the impression that uh, uh, when he or she sees a rubber hand that, that it's his own and when you uh, start brushing it or maybe hit it with a hammer, you have the feeling that it's your own hand. And he's now working on that idea with the use of um, um, yeah, with virtual re reality. And what, what I really found interesting, and maybe you rec recognize this person, but this is Sigmund Freud. And um, he talked about, well, it's most of the time it's pretty difficult if you're um, doing self-counseling. Um, so what about uh, you can uh, give advice to your friends, that's pretty easy. Uh, or your partner, and then you say, well, you should do this or you should that, you should do that. But concerning yourself, it's, it's uh, remarkably difficult. And that's also something I encounter. So what could help is um, that you talk to yourself, but then you're talking to yourself while you are in the body of Sigmund Freud. And Mel Slater said it was not his personal choice, but uh, with a survey, a lot of people, um, I think Sigmund Freud was first and Angelina Jolie was second. Uh, and this is an example from his um, uh, YouTube channel where you get measured and then you state your problem um, and then it's be being recorded. And then you switch places and then you are in the body of Sigmund Freud. And you can also look in the mirror and then you see, yeah, I'm Sigmund Freud. And then you hear yourself talking um, yeah, to you as Sigmund Freud. And then you can yeah, give your advice as Sigmund Freud to yourself. And then you swap, switch back and then you're yourself and then you hear Sigmund Freud talking to you, if you still can understand what I'm saying. But the point is, um, this is of course pretty cool, is that also uh, the participants in the study, they also reported they had more self-knowledge after this session compared to a regular session. And also that uh, they were happier they, and also not only directly after the session but also uh, like a week later so it's also led some of the other science uh, journalists also to talk well can virtual rea reality be a replace therapy or maybe uh, be an, an extra intervention in therapy uh, for example fear of flying PTSD or even depression so that's the talk of Mel Slater uh, and the closing keynote was by Patty Maas. She's a professor at MIT in Boston. And she made a remark uh, that looking at the topics in the conference, like I mentioned, there was a lot about motor um, and sense augmentation, but not so much about cognitive augmentation. And she gave a couple of examples of uh, studies and uh, gadget wearables where MIT is working on. And um, she reminded me of a couple of books uh, for example, Moonwalking with Einstein. And Moonwalking with Einstein is about so-called memory champions. So they can recall a list with topics or a deck of cards, these kinds of things. And one of the tricks of these memory champions is they use spatial uh, memory. So uh, for example, if you have to remember all your groceries, um, you can look at all those words and try to get them into your head. But uh, these memory champions, they're better because they envision themselves getting into their house and, oh, there's milk on the, on the carpet and there's bread on the, on the television. Um, and they use uh, a device called Nevermind with augmented reality to uh, place certain icons in, uh, yeah, in your spatial field. And uh, they talked about the Super Bowl winners in the United States. 
and then she then you see the person being in the elevator and there she could see a dolphin and that's because the Miami Dolphins won the Super Bowl in a certain year. So that's pretty amazing. And that also, uh, they tested it and it also leads to better memorization of um, well, what the um, uh, group and the control group, uh, what the group was uh, trying to memorize compared to a control group. Another device is, um, she also mentioned the book by uh, Thinking uh, Smart and Slow by uh, uh, Fast and Slow by Dania Kahneman. Uh, also a device uh, that can hear uh, like a glasses that can uh, record audio and also uh, with a little speaker and they were testing like can it um, uh, listen to the news for example or if you're in conversation with somebody and then say well the statement by that person or on the media is true or false and then, then it can you know, uh, 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 transmit that via the audio. So that's also really an, an, a cognitive enhancement, of course. And the third example she gave was about the Proteus, Proteus effect, uh, where they used uh, Snapchat filters. Uh, and that kind of looks like what Mel Slater talked about, because you, uh, they, did, um, um, if they looked at like if a person had to do certain creative skills, and then they looked at themselves as just a normal like you can see me now, but they lose a Snapchat filter that you are very young, like a child, but also like an inventor Snapchat filter or sort of an Einstein. And people that were using the, the child filter and the Einstein filter were more creative than people who are not using a filter. So that's like the Sigmund Freud analogy. So these are three examples to, that you can increase your memory, uh, um, yeah, become a, a, a slow um, uh, thinker, which most of the times is, uh, is better than give it more thought and also that you're more creative. So I think th these are re three really interesting examples. And she also talked about a, a device uh, also by MIT called the um, Alter Ego. And like um, there were also some other examples in the conference themselves by uh, uh, a group of scholars that were also using speech technology um, where you can speak without using your mouth and some of the times they are looking at brain signals but they also must they were looking at um, the movements of these um, muscles in your uh, down your throat and what if you can move these in a in a, in a small way without, yeah, without your mouth uh, making these um, uh, movements, like actually speaking, and how can, um, yeah, how can you thereby uh, uh, speak? And of course, this really uh, can help you, uh, can help patients which are, we, who are not able to speak, but maybe in the future it all has a yeah, different way of uh, communicating maybe with uh, computers, maybe with other people. So I think that's also a pretty nice example of human augmentation. So this is pretty cool. Um, what you see here is a gather town. So I think the organizing committee did a really good, uh, nice job because uh, besides having the Zoom link, uh, there was a YouTube stream. Um, there were also uh, a Google Drive uh, directory with all the uh, papers and also with the videos by the researchers and besides that you also had gather town uh, and gather town is um, um, is where a sort of virtual uh, not a virtual but like a sort of networking uh, space uh, where you can walk to the uh, different posters like you can see here uh, go to the exhibition there were also some networking places, so you can gather around, you can talk to other people. I also had a conversation with um, one of the researchers, sorry, I don't remember your name, uh, from Lübeck, in the northern part of uh, Germany. Uh, it's near Hamburg. Um, and it was, uh, I really liked it because it was a really fun way to look at the, the videos, to look at some of the papers, um, yeah, also to, uh, come in contact with uh, fellow um, if people who are interested or also to come in contact with uh, the researchers of all these interesting ideas and in interesting fields. And like you can see here, when you walk to one of the uh, stages in, uh, uh, in Gather Town, you can also 
um, yeah, watch, uh, look at uh, the PDFs of the papers or also uh, look at the, um, like the posters of the, uh, of the study. And also, of course, uh, there were also some um, demonstrations where you can also look at the uh, YouTube video. So I thought it was really a uh, nice way um, yeah, to interact with other people. There was also a Discord channel, by the way. So I think, um, uh, like I, I mentioned, like I talked with one of the organizers, Pedro. Uh, yeah, of course, we are more and more used in during times of COVID to do things online. Um, but I think this conference really did a really awesome job to uh, to yeah, reap all the benefits you can have by uh, doing these kinds of things online. So that's a, a short explanation of the Gather Town, which I uh, really liked. So uh, thumbs up. And now you're going to watch an interview I did with Pedro Lopez a couple of days after the conference in which we talked about the conference, uh, things that surprised him and also about the background of a lot of these developments in the domain of augmented humans. What I found interesting also looking at the background of the people that were presenting is that uh, I had the feeling that there is a lot of um, uh, work in this field uh, done in Japan and also yeah. in Germany and also, of course, in Chicago and probably also Finland because that was the original place of yeah. the conference. Is, is, it, is that a true um, yeah, picture I have? Absolutely. You, ha you had a very accurate reading, I would say. Um, in fact, when, when we got all the paper submissions in and we looked at geographically where the authors were distributed, we were very happy to see people from different corners of the world, not as, you know, we're still needing to, to reach further, but there were focal points, right? So Japan was one, and then I, I would say Germany slash Europe was another one. And even US is very, very small compared to these two places. Then it showed up more in registrations. So the, the, the graph you'll see, there are sort of two graphs, one at the op at the closing keynote where my, my uh, co-chair, Yona Hakila, from the University of Lapland is showing where all the registered participants come from. You see a, like a wider distribution, and there's a and there's a graphic at the opening opening ceremony where Paul Stroheimer from Saarland University, who was one of the program chairs, the people in charge of checking the papers and all that, uh, shows the submissions where people come from submissions. And then you're totally right, Peter. It's mostly Japan and Europe. So the couple of historical notes there: the conference was founded in Japan. And, and and together with someone that I believe is in France. And so there's a very strong contentious um, of Japanese community involving the augmented community. But that's from a historical perspective. There's a secondary perspective, which I think is incredibly interesting to analyze, which is the Japanese researcher community has been always very interested in these questions of augmenting bodies, augmenting intellects. That echoes in many ways, in, in of course, in their own um, media and you know cyborgism is a very traditional trend in in animation movies and things like that and histories and etc but in research that's so 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 incredibly clear a lot of the collaborators that i have in japan such as Shunichi kazahara was a person who i work a lot on these things of electrical muscle stimulation they work very very deeply in this topic of augmentation and in particular of what happens to human bodies when they become augmented when they have super perceptions when they have um multiple abilities and things like that so i think that community is 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 always we're going to be really really strong we will all have to catch up with the <laughs> japanese community in that sense and then the, there's a big contingent of, of europeans working on this space a lot of them coming from um from Germany, which I'm always very happy to see because I was I was in Germany prior to moving to Chicago and I lived there for the last seven years. And, and so it's it's a pleasure to see so many people from, from, from there working there. I don't know what drives them to do that historically or another perspective, but they've all been super big supporters. Uh, many of them are in the organizing committee of Augmented Humans, but I just know that many of them, their research is about augmenting. I think in that space, they're very interested in wearables and also in the cognitive augmentations, whereas in the Japanese side, it's it's sort of even broader and it spans perception and illusions and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting to have these insights about also the historical uh, origins of, of this field. But I think- And I must the, say, this is all my perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it's really, uh, that's also my personal interest in this domain is that it's becoming more and more important uh, yeah, to, to have an interaction with technology also because we are getting older 
Um, mm -hmm. And technologies is, are getting uh, much more powerful. So uh, I think that's really interesting. And um, uh, almost the last question, but I wondered, we talked about uh, the next phase of wearables or what comes after wearables. Um, when you look at all the, the topics and papers and you were, are involved in the, in the committee now for, I think more, a couple of more years, right? Also before this year? Um, I've not been involved in augmented humans before. I've been, oh, well, okay. this is yes and a no. I, I have <laughs> been, <laughs> I've been talking to a lot of these people for a number of years, trying to, to improve the conference altogether. We've been really trying to have more people, have more papers and et cetera. So you could, you could come me, but officially I wasn't an organizer, <laughs> really just trying to help out. And uh, I don't okay. know if I will, I will do more next year, um, but there'll be great people coming next year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I wonder uh, if you, uh, following this field, uh, did you see other lines or something that surprised you? That is a really good question. I think, I think there are a couple of other lines of, of, of thought in there. You're totally right. Not just, not just this idea of what comes next, and that particularly that's a lot of my own research question, sort of what comes next in terms of the big interface paradigm shift. So I, I see a couple of things. So, and I think we can always see the awards that we give out as, as a means to also check how much these lines are, are, are being validated by, by the research being put out by the researchers. So we put out two, two interesting, I think, awards this year. One was for, for a paper by, um, by Yaman Saraiji. He's, he used to be at Keio University in Japan, and he's done a, a number of, of research with his colleagues, of course, on putting exoskeletons in the human body to provide you with more limbs than you have. This is a, this is a fairly old research topic in, in robotics, but really Yaman and his, in his collaborators have given new life to it by thinking how these things can be controlled and how these things can be interacted. If you do have extra limbs, how will you control them? And so this year I felt we, we celebrated that by giving Yaman a special recognition for, for, for a paper that he has put out that has been gathering a lot of attention in the media um, but all, and, and, and the research community. But also um, there was a session in the conference called Remixed Bodies. And this idea of remixing bodies, I think is something that spans the whole conference, all right? We saw at the opening keynote, Mel Slater, talking pretty much about remixing bodies to provide people with new perspectives in psychology and psychology treatment. So what is the power of, he's essentially talking about what is the transformative power of VR in psychology, in a psychiatric office, if we can radically transform your body and through that process, radically transform the way you perceive reality. For instance, is shown work where folks with, with a number of, of impairments or, or situation disabilities were able to surpass those by seeing themselves immersed in a different avatar in you know, a psychiatric context, which I think is very powerful. And it's again, it's a remixing bodies. Then other people this year were ex again exploring this idea of physically remixing bodies. What if I have you know, two limbs or more legs or something like that, right? How can I control them? How can I, how can I use them? What new things, physical things in my environment can I do with it? Obviously I can hold more things at the same time. I can perform two tasks at the same time and so forth, which is very interesting because we, again, it's what I was talking about earlier. We've, with 40 years of, of revolutions in computing, we are, when I say the word multitasking, we all imagine multiple windows and I'm doing two spreadsheets at the same time, but nobody imagines multitasking like I am cooking and soldering or making a circuit at the same time. But what, what these people are putting out is ways for us to do that. So I'm seeing that as a really big, as a really big trend in the last maybe five years of augmented human is this idea of remixing bodies. Um, mm. And then the other trend that, that I think we've identified this year, and again, we give a, um, an award to these authors is this idea of what are the other, the other senses of the human body that technology hasn't really interfaced with. So we gave an award for a work called electric gustation. Gustation is in taste, um, eating things. And, and, and this work on, on electric gustation has been, been very transformative because precisely how many of the interfaces we, you and I, Peter, have that you know, can transform our, our sense of, of taste. Well, not digital interfaces. Our phones don't do any of that. Our VR headsets don't do any of that. And it sounds like in VR, it should be incredibly important. The only th interfaces that do that are analog things in the kitchen. And so, and so the idea that we could electrically stimulate our tongue or 
our mouths to transform and create artificial flavors that aren't there is incredibly powerful, for instance, in VR. And so we've seen a number of works in the last year of augmented human inspired by that and inspired by other senses too. How can we bring, you know, the sense of balance, right, which is inside our inner ear to interfaces, how we can bring our sense of smell to interfaces. Petty Maz in her closing keynote shows a bunch of things in the sense of smell as well. And, and those aren't as ubiquitous. Those are really cutting edge research. We don't know how these devices are going to look like in 10 years. Exactly what can you put in the headset? Is it electric station? Is it actually just a thing that squirts flavors in your mouth? We don't know. But it is truly at the Augmented Humans community, and of course at all the other conferences, KaiWist, that people are seeing what might be some of these devices in the future. And they are understanding how they work. They're testing them out and so forth. So I, I really see a bunch of um, papers every year that explore these kinds of new modalities, I would call. Uh, and they're new just in the sense that researchers haven't found how to how to in incorporate them. They're, they're obviously everyday things that you and I feel all the time, not new in that sense. Mm, yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. Uh, thanks for, for these insights. Uh, and of course, thanks for organizing uh, the conference with your fellow committee members, of course. Um, yeah, I, I, will just, also... I should absolutely, if you don't mind me just giving a, a big shout out to them. I, I know I cannot take 20 minutes to just say everybody's name, but but at least um, I just wanted to mention that Jonah Hakila from the University of Lapland and, and Thomas Kosh were my general co-chairs. And, you know, the, these people put as much work as I did or, or more into just making sure the conference worked out. And uh, and of course, please, if, you, if you're watching this, go to the website and see see everybody else's names because these people put all so much work into making the conference a reality sorry peter go yeah. ahead no 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 that's what what i want to say that i will put a link in the in the show notes to the to the whole live stream it's about Fantastic. i don't know eight hours eight hours 13 hours <laughs> no. yeah <laughs> but you can go to the you can skip or go to certain parts and uh, i will also put a link to uh, to the conference site because it's augmented-humans.com if i remember from I will put yeah, that right Yeah, augmented-humans.org. Yeah. Oh, dot .org. Yeah, sorry. So yeah. augmented-humans.org. And um, exactly. all right. Thank you, Pedro, for your time and uh, the answers. Thank you gave. so much. It was a pleasure. Please subscribe to my channel. And also, if you have a question or a remark, leave a comment down below. Go to my website if you want to have a free download. And if you are interested in more in-depth knowledge and know-how, about human enhancement, human augmentation, biohacking and the superhuman era.